Excellent. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us for the sweep workshop. My name is Keith Abels and I'm the soil and water specialist at the Sonoma RCD. And I wanna thank everyone for being part of this and joining us today. I'd like to thank the Farm Bureau, the Sonoma County Farm Bureau for being a co-sponsor on this and helping us with the outreach as well as the other organizations, ag organizations that helped us to uh, promote this event. And it's, uh, it's a good opportunity and I'm gonna get more into it in a moment. Um, I'm just gonna say real quick, uh, a couple quick notes about Zoom. Uh, I think we're all a lot more familiar with Zoom now than we used to be or wanna be, but uh, it's, it's great that we can all meet over Zoom and just a few things. This is recording. I think you all got that message. Um, so we'll be recording this and it will be available to others. Um, there was a, some confusion with some of the outreach that got done and some people think this is happening tomorrow because of some of the outreach, uh, but, but do let people know that this will all be recorded and available and we'll be able to share that with folks and, um, and they can see what the information is. And if there's more questions, they can always call me and ask me. Um, so I would ask everyone to mute themselves while, the, while we're going here. Um, we, and we wanna make sure we don't hear any background noise uh, so people can focus um, as best as possible. So mute, uh, when we, I'm gonna be giving the presentation and then we'll get into question, answer and discussion at the end and you'll be able to unmute yourself uh, then. So you'll be able to see that in the bar that uh, it, you might be able to see it right now at the top of my screen, but at the yeah, bottom of the screen is a, a bar and that's where you can mute yourself. You can turn your video on and off. And uh, if we hear a lot of noise or something distracting, uh, we can mute you on our end and might do that, but then you can unmute yourself again later when uh, it's time for question and answer. So I think that covers everything. Uh, Shannon, jump in, or Robert. Uh, they're my co-engineers right now, helping to make this all happen. And, and if I missed anything, uh, feel free to jump in. And uh, Shannon will be asking the questions later and she might interject at some point uh, if there's any important information. So uh, thank you, Shannon. Uh, a couple quick words on RCD, and then we'll get into the SWEEP program. This is uh, the Sonoma RCD we're putting on. There's two RCDs in our county, Sonoma County. The other is Goldridge, but uh, about 80, 85% of, of the territory is, is Sonoma, and that's our district. And, and, and Goldridge is sort of defined from Sebastopol westward and down towards the Dairy Belt to Marin and then up to Russian River at Forestville, but then the rest of the county is Sonoma RCD. Um, Goldridge is very helpful too. We work with them on a lot of stuff. So I encourage you to look at our websites to get a better picture of everything we're up to and what we're doing. But I will just say uh, our main mission is to save soil uh, or to not to save, but to protect soil and water. And so that can mean, you know, uh, improved management, conservation practices and projects. We help with planning, we do design work, um, we help with implementation in a lot of cases, uh, we do a lot of education work, and uh, sometimes we are able to help fund projects we've planned for. So I do uh, invite you to learn more about the RCD and what we can do and how we can help and take a look at our website or get in touch to learn more if you're not already familiar. Uh, and soil health has been a big uh, focus of, of, of the RCD soil health and is something I've been doing and that's looking at you know cover crops and, and compost and um, we have the North Coast Soil Hub and I invite you to learn more about that. And uh, we're doing carbon farm planning, a lot of good stuff happening and I invite you to be involved and check out our website. Um, one thing before we, I really get going here because I want to make sure to remember this is uh, another RCD put together this really nice roadmap, we call it, for the SWEEP program. And it includes um, sort of a decision tree of whether you'd be eligible or not and uh, whether it's a good idea to apply. And then it has some of the information you need. So if you look in the chat, you will find that. Um, which reminds me, I forgot to say that the format of Zoom we're in, if you, when you have questions and answers uh, or questions that you want answers for, or you have comments, put it in the chat. There is no question answer, but if you look at the bar at the bottom of your screen, 
um, there's a chat and you go in there and you can put your question in there, but you can also click on the link that should be in there already. And that provides the roadmap and you could copy and paste that and put it somewhere else if you like and look at that later or share it with others that are interested. Um, so with that, I've got a slideshow here, a PowerPoint, and we're gonna go through that and um, talk about the State Water Efficiency and Enhancement Program, which uh, from here forward, we will call SWEEP. And uh, that is a CDFA administered program. So everyone see this slide change? Uh, looks like everything's working well. So here we go. So what is the program? It's a, it's a competitive grant application program uh, that the CDFA administers and it provides financial incentives to, to California agricultural operations to improve their irrigation systems uh, when there are projects that can both save water and reduce greenhouse gases. It has to do both of those things. Um, and so it was authorized in this current year's budget. Um, it's been going since 2014, so there's been numerous rounds, but there hasn't been one since 2019, and it was unsure if the program was going to continue. So fortunately it is, and it's funded higher than before. Um, there's, there's $43 million available to disperse to, to agricultural producers. I have seen higher numbers listed, uh, but the one I've seen the most is 43 million. I don't know why I've seen different numbers, but um, I recently saw that on the CDFA website, which we will take a look at before too long. Um, the solicitation period opened on October 19th of this year. Uh, they're doing it a little differently this year, whereas in the past they've had a shorter period and then they've taken in all applications and then they review them and notify people. Now it's like first come, first, come, first serve. If, you, uh, if your project meets the criteria and scores enough points, then you will be funded if you uh, get in line quick enough. So that puts a little more pressure to, to, um, to get your application in, in, in the past. Uh, but if they do not receive requests for all the money uh, and, and award that sooner, then in January 18th, they will close this round down. And it's not clear when they will offer it another round, it could be later this year or later in 2022 or, or in even later than that, it's unclear. Uh, in the past, they have funded projects up to 100,000, uh, but now 200,000 is the limit. Uh, so you could look at a bigger project if you have something like that. You also notice the project implementation period. If you were to get an award, then you enter in a contract with CDFA, which I will discuss later in the past, then there's a period where you have to actually do the project and finish it. Uh, and in the past, they gave you 18 months, but you can see here at the bottom bullet, it's June 30th of next year to June 30th, two years later in 2024. So um, just let me do that. Um, so yes, as I mentioned, October 19th, they opened it up. They are reviewing applications as they receive them. And that goes till January 18th, and they will announce funding. Uh, I don't know if they're already telling people. I do know of one person that's applied. They haven't heard back yet. They applied uh, a week or two ago, but they are gonna announce as they go and not wait till the very end of the solicitation period, uh, unless that's when you apply. Um, so application overview. Um, there's a number of things on their website, which we will go take a look at in a moment. Let me see something here. Oh, yes. And uh, on that are these things, the budget, uh, the, the GHG calculator, irrigation water savings assessment tool, videos uh, previously awarded, et cetera. So let's take a look here. If you, uh, here's the website. Uh, if you just Google CDFA sweep, it comes up at the top of your screen. Uh, but here's the website, and there's lots of good information here. So I'm just going to give you a quick tour without getting into everything. Um, but here you can see how oh, here it says the award between 43 and 45 million. But there's some really good stuff here. If you click on this one, it's like a 42-page document, and it, it just gets into all the nuts and bolts and 
details of what's involved with this, this application and grant. And I really would encourage you if you're moving forward to take a look at that. A lot of things that are, that are eligible or not, um, a lot of your questions could be answered there. But I also use this frequently asked questions. Um, I actually, it's 14 pages. I've ran through that a few times in the last couple of weeks. And uh, it really gets into the pertinent questions. So I invite you to take a look at that because that gets more to the point of a lot of the things that you might be asking. Although a lot of those questions are really from people maybe more in the Valley and different types of agriculture than, than you'd be doing. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's good information. So I, I invite you to look at that. Um, and then there's the, the budget worksheet, the saving, water savings calculator and the GHG calculator. I've mentioned that and we will get into that more later. So if you're interested in applying, uh, you hit this. Uh, there's plenty of off ramps once you're there. So there's once you hit that, uh, your, your investment is only the time you want to put in it. And uh, it will lead you to something called the WiseHive portal. You need to create an account. And, uh, and that's very easy to do. And then you get a number. And the number is, is really important because then you need to include that number with everything involved with your application and use that going forward. So you start there, you get, the, you get that number after registering and then you can access the application and we will look at that more. Um, technical assistance provider, uh, this is just a workshop. Unfortunately, we are not technical assistance providers ourselves, um, but if you click on this, I'm gonna go there for a second. There's some statewide ones, but in Northern California, there's a number of listings here for those of you who might know uh, California Land Stewardship Institute, if you're involved with Napa. Uh, I don't know how much they're able to help folks over here, but they might. Um, I put in, I've asked both Mendocino and Napa, who are RCDs, who are TSPs for this at the moment, if they're able to help, they may be able to help people in our, our district, but I do not know yet. We can offer some limited help with, you know, answering questions, um, perhaps helping with some of the quantifications. Uh, we could help with some maps. If you need to generate a map for your design, which we'll, you'll see in a little bit, uh, but we can't take you through the whole application or write all of it, but we can help you to, to some degree. So keep that in mind. Uh, but as we go down here, um, here you can see these names listed. So you can contact our local UCCE office. And I have been in touch with John Gorman. He can help. I mean, once again, he can't write the whole application, but he, uh, he ha has had experience with this with his own uh, place of work. And he is a TA provider in that capacity. So take a look there. That was, uh, that was right here under the apply here button. And then uh, there's more people to check in with. There's workshops, a whole list of workshops. You could go, but you are at a workshop now. So uh, that I leave up to you. It looks like they have finished their informational workshops. They did record one of them. Uh, I saw the one, I don't know why they're, they're listing this, but not that. I guess they haven't updated this in a while, but they recorded the first one. I saw the second one on 11.4. I actually thought it was pretty useful and you may too. I don't know how the first one went, but I imagine it was very similar. So some of that information I shared on timelines is here. You can find that here. Uh, and then some very basic questions answered here, but I don't think you'll need that because you'll learn that today. So they're a little slow to update this. Like I say, it's rolling applications, but as of November 4th, 10 uh, million four had been uh, requested of the 43 million. I don't know where it's at. It's two weeks later now. So hopefully uh, they're still doing good, but they have not said anything about it being full. And of that 10 for who knows how many they actually uh, award. So it's something less than that that was uh, awarded. So there's still money available. Uh, here's some of these same things. They were to the left we just looked at. Um, but then as you go down these resources, there's some there's some good stuff, uh, public comments about that and, and the request for grant applications. This past solicitations, sorry about that, uh, is really important actually. I've used that a lot in the past. It basically shows you what's been funded and uh, in all, all areas of the, of the uh, state. And it gives you a really good idea of what 
people are getting money for. So I, I would uh, I would look at that. And then the types of uh, practices they're funding. Uh, these technical resources, uh, that's really good. Uh, you can look at that. Sweep Sub Advisory Group, they've created more of an advisory committee for this. And that's some of their thinking on what's going on. There's some videos in here and what people have done. That's, you know, there's another one. So that's good stuff uh, if you have time and the interest to go that deep. So with that, we are going to go back to here. And so that was the Sweep website. Once again, um, see it if, if you Google CDFA Sweep, you will find that. Uh, that is from 2019, a screenshot. Um, we don't need to do that because we just took the tour. So, um, oh. So, who is eligible? I'm sorry, I'm having a little problem here. I don't know why that's doing that. So, the folks that are eligible include pretty much legit agriculture operations in the state of California. And uh, obviously, uh, some others, native tribes are, are eligible to apply, but once again, it's for agricultural operations. And so um, basically you can see here is a little more definition in that second bullet, um, but it's not for cannabis. That's, you know, the things that are grown in our county, I think all ag is really eligible, um, but cannabis is not eligible yet for this. Uh, perhaps in future rounds, it will be. Um, and so, yes, it has to be a, in California too. Like it, you might be a California company, but it has to be for a project in our state. Up to 200,000 per unique tax ID. Uh, that's pretty important to note. If you've previously been funded for an APN, that APN cannot uh, apply again. But you're, if you're an operation that has more than one APN and you have a project on a different APN that has not applied to sweep, you could apply for that. And basically, up to uh, $600,000 is what they'll do over time. I imagine over time they'll up that um, so that people can keep making improvements. Uh, but at, the point, at this point, that's the limit. You have to be 18 years old and notice the bottom is bolded. That's really important that you can't just do a project that reduces GHGs like a pump replacement if it's not gonna save water too and vice versa, it's got to save water as well. So it's got to do both. It just can't do one. And if you're going to proceed, you know, it takes some time to do this process. It's, it, you know, I would say, you know, you'd be lucky to do it in 10 hours. It's going to take you more if you need to do design work or planning and work with others and making plans. Uh, it'll take even longer. So uh, you want to make sure it's a pretty big project and the numbers add up. I have talked to a couple of people who had very small projects in mind or maybe just wanted to get a couple of soil moisture sensors, I don't think they would fund you. Uh, I don't think you'd get enough points uh, for that unless you can really prove um, uh, you know, some notable water and GHG savings. Um, they haven't funded that much in Sonoma County to date, but there's more money in this program. And as I mentioned, uh, I think there's gonna be more longevity for the program. They weren't sure two years ago if it was gonna continue, but they seem to have gotten support, funded at a higher level, and I think there's more of a long-term look at it right now. So even if you don't apply now, this is all good to start planning because there will be more rounds. And um, you know, if you have significant projects, you have opportunity. So let's see, why is that not going? That's strange. Uh, okay. All right, this has totally frozen up on me. There we go. But now it is working. All right. So exclusions, and if anyone knows how I can get rid of this bar here, it will not go away. All right, so I'm gonna keep going here. Um, exclusions, uh, if you're an academic university, this, you, you, you can't apply for this um, unless you really had a legit commercial operation. Um, it's not for research, it's for really active farms and what you can do on there. And then the second bullet's important too. You can't fund the same thing if you're doing NRCS equip or have an equip contract. Um, you, uh, you could fund one part of a project with equip money and a different part with sweep funding, but you can't do both at once. So um, 
you need to keep that in mind. Um, they, there's a lot of emphasis on supporting projects in severely disadvantaged communities. And uh, I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, as you can see here, it includes African Americans, Native Indians, Alaskan Natives, Hispanics, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Um, but for a little more information on that, um, just a second, I'm gonna try something here. Okay, I guess it's just not going to work for me. Pardon me while I get back to here. There we go. Slide. Um, so a severely disadvantaged community is defined as a community whose annual household income is below 60% of the statewide average. And here's an interesting thing here. So here's a, to find out what's here, you can go to this website, which we will take a little visit to. And then here's a map and it shows all the parks, which is really interesting. It's kind of an interesting combination, but if you click this button and then you X that so you can see better and we zoom in to our area, you can see there are some, they're the orange areas. Um, and so you can see some in our area and that would give you more points um, to to for your for your application should you be interested in that um or, or should you not interested but should you comply with that i know that's not going to be that many places in our county um so what are the practices that 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 can get funded um it's improved irrigation water management. So that could be soil moisture probes, uh, a weather station, plant sensing equipment, you know, anything that helps you with your scheduling to tell you when you can, when you should irrigate and when you should hold off so that you're not just irrigating because it's Tuesday or it's hot or because it's a historical habit, but, but tools that help you indicate when, when it's time to turn the water on. Um, Micro irrigation, now that's gonna apply less here. Most, I assume most people online are, are vineyard folks, which means you're gonna be probably already using drip. So that's micro irrigation. Uh, also micro sprayers are considered micro irrigation. But should you have a situation where you're trying to get from uh, sprinklers, you know, and replace sprinklers, um, you might be eligible for that or if you're using flood irrigation, uh, which I doubt is anyone on this call, that's that's something. And they've done a lot of that in the valley. Uh, and so uh, pump replacements is a huge one and a huge opportunity. There's a lot of old pumps in this uh, in this county and in our district. And uh, that's a good opportunity if you can improve and use a more energy efficient pump. Uh, they're funding a lot of that. And because we don't have the, the kinds of irrigation systems as they do in the valley where a lot of people use flood and furrow, you know, most people are on groundwater here and are pumping. So that's where there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, fuel conversion, uh, if you can go to electricity from, from uh, diesel especially or gasoline, uh, that that is an eligible one. Solar, they're funding more and more solar pumping uh, pump units, so that's another good opportunity. Uh, variable frequency drives, uh, for those who aren't familiar, that's a way to throttle your electricity. So think of your gas pedal in your car. I mean, when you turn on most pumps, they have one speed, so you might have a smaller block and it's operating at the same level as a larger block, but that's not really necessary. It's just like in your car, you uh, you put the gas on when you need to go faster and you take it off or hit the brakes when you need to go slower. And that's what a variable frequency drive does with electricity. So it's really good and they're expensive. So it's a good opportunity. Uh, low pressure systems, that's basically like going from overhead to, to like a low pressure, something more like drip uh, in our case, uh, something where you can reduce pr pumping uh, which really, I think the soil moisture probes and those types of things we talked about are, are there or other projects that might have water and GHG reductions. Um, you see the, the flow meter here in the picture and it's, uh, it's super 
uh, it's super important to know that all projects have to have a flow meter as a way to measure what you're doing uh, because there is some monitoring with the projects for a few years afterwards and you need a flow meter unless you're part of a system where there already is one uh, or part of a district that maybe already monitors the if they can uh, if they can really look at the, the how it is in your specific parcel uh, and so uh, but they will pay for that that's what's great is they will pay you know you can apply for that funding to pay for it and the installation um, so some requirements you can only submit one application per legal business name or unique uh, tax identification number so uh, if you're a sole proprietor you use the four last four digits of your social you don't need to give the whole thing and you cannot build on in a previous project or work done on that same APN as I mentioned earlier more requirements you have to use the sweep irrigation water savings assessment tool and um, and you have to use that to estimate your water savings uh, you have to do the GHG quantification tool um, and you have to fill out a, a number of other things on the application and you have to include a pump efficiency test that's been done since 2019. And you have to provide 12 months of energy records from your most recent irrigation season or year. We'll talk more about that later too. Uh, so once again, you can't you, you some of these things I've said, but you can't use it to expand agriculture operations where it's not existing now. And you can't use it to uh, install a well or increase the depth of a well. I mean, like I said, you can replace pumps, but you can't do well work with it. Can't do research. Um, you may need to do design work or planning for this, but it will not pay for that. Um, and any tool or equipment you use has to have a useful life of <clears throat> at least two years. Uh, they, they, in your contract, when you get, if you get uh, funded, you'll see they're going to, I think for three years, be sort of in touch with you, but they really like to see people getting equipment and putting practice in place for 10 years. So this kind of basic, we'll get more into this, you know, you, you, you file your application they review it administratively, make sure the key things are in there, and then an actual technical committee of, of uh, you know, a sm you know, small group of scientists or a, a, the scientist who works for CTFA, it might be one person, will review it, and uh, they'll, they'll let you know whether you got it or not and provide some feedback if you didn't get it, and then they move into a grant agreement phase. Um, so here's all the things you need to include in your application. And uh, towards the end, we will actually take a little dive into the uh, application. And so you'll see some of this again, but uh, you gotta have a project design. And we're gonna talk about all these more uh, as I go on in the slideshow. Uh, you have to have a completed budget uh, worksheet, a solar system quote, if you're doing solar, Got to fill out those two tools I've mentioned a couple times, 12 months of GHG emission documentation. So there you see fuel receipts or utility bills of your most recent use and uh, pump efficiency tests from 2019 or later. So here's project design. Um, it has to include all these elements, the APN, a schematic of the project, uh, some of the agronomic information and, and a holistic overview. So what does that look like? Here we go. So here you can see, uh, I don't know, for, oh, sorry. For some reason, I cannot get rid of this bar, which uh, has never happened to me. Um, if you, you are able to uh, press the, the pin on, icon on the far left of that blue bar and it should go away. Yeah, I don't see a pin icon on it, to be honest. Oh, sorry about that. So uh, are you seeing that, Shannon? Yeah, do you see the, um, the, I see the example of project design, but the blue bar, is that what you're talking about? There's the icon a, on the far left, if you click it, it should go away. 
Yeah, I think you're saying something different. Okay. Oh, I see what you're saying. See, for some reason, uh, so you're not seeing the the, the uh, Zoom commands mute. Oh so. no, nobody else can see those. So okay, okay, good to know. You see everything pretty well. Because for some reason, uh, this never happened. That's like will not go away for me. And uh, all right, oh. so so thank you, Shannon. We'll continue here though, since you can see it. So here you can see here's a project design. Uh, it shows the pipeline. Uh, that replaces a ditch. This is in the valley where they probably did furrow irrigation and you put the APN, it's 160 acres with the specific amount of corn being grown there. A couple of soil moisture probes and then down below you have the solar ET and uh, the uh, VFD, a flow meter, a new pump and ET station. So there you go. So that's what you need to include. So the budget worksheet. Um, so you need to include all supply and equipment costs, labor costs and other, and it has to match the design and be consistent with that. Um, if you get quotes, that's kind of the best to include. Otherwise you can use NRCS equip payment schedules that you can find on NRCS, but do keep in mind that uh, those tend to be quite low. A lot of that's for other places in the country where costs are less or they just tend to be low, even for, uh, I think, California schedules. So if you have something from a, a vendor, a quote that's reasonable and accurate, then use that. Um, and there you can see, I, me I mentioned the draft request for applications, which is on the, their website. You can look there for what's allowable or not allowable. So with that, let's see. Oh my. Now I need to find, there we go. So here's the budget worksheet. Um, I filled one out yesterday. So here you put in your ID number that I said you get when you apply, your organization name. This automatically populates. So they have a few categories here. Um, irrigation system improvements. I put, you know, drip hose, for instance. Uh, irrigation water management, that's specifically probes, a flow meter, or ET stations. Uh, pump and energy efficiency, energy improvements. So that's like a pump or VFD. Solar gets its own category. So um, it's kind of interesting. So you can put that in, and then you, um, you, you put, you know, like, uh, wait go up a little bit. So here, like I, I put, you know, for trip hose, you know, $1,000. Uh, and then it automatically fills these categories here. And I think I mentioned that up to 25% of your application can go towards labor. And so um, as you populate this, and just to give you an example, like say you're getting five stations, you'll see how, or that you put in manually the total amount, and then you'll see this number here to the left go up 102,000. So total grant request here. So as you scroll down this, here's where you put labor. So, you know, if I just, like I say, don't, these numbers don't mean anything. I just threw numbers in there. Let's say it was 50, 100 hours of 50. Um, so this is important because like, say, say this was a thousand hours you put, notice how this goes red and you need to be, if it goes red, they're gonna just reject your application and tell you it's disqualified and you'll have to redo it. So. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> so you want to keep an eye on this number. And if anything goes red on this spreadsheet, then you need to adjust your budget accordingly. Now you might have an expense that is, you know, your labor is too much, or you might be contributing other things to this project that are you're not asking for money for. So if you go down, you can see there's a matching cost share, matching funds. So you know, here I put in, you know, it, it has a drop down menu, I put cash, $1,000. And so that ends up here in your matching funds. Now matching funds are not required, but they do strengthen your position and they show your sort of commitment to the project. So it's something to consider. So last thing I'll say on this is there's a readme tab. Uh, there's some instructions there and that might be useful for you as well. So this one's pretty straightforward and I encourage you to uh, take a look. Hey, Keith, we have a question. Is now a good time? Uh, yeah, sure. 
So does a distribution uniformity assessment have to be done and included in the app for sweep? Uh, no, uh, no, it does not have to be done. That's a good question. If you have it, you put it on that on that design um, schematic that I showed you, but you do not have to do that. Uh, and there's no way you could do one right now. Like, um, you know, there's no one that would really be able to run out and do it in time for you. So uh, it adds, uh, especially if you, you know, are improving it, that adds to the, your, your argument to get it, but it's not required. So um, I'm gonna move to the water assessment tool now. And, um, and this is important. This one, this one's pretty, um, pretty easy to do, pretty straightforward. So as you look at this, well, I'll, I will just actually, I'm just gonna go to it if it'll let me out of here. That's strange. Uh, <laughs> it's not letting me out. Um, because let me try something here. Pardon me again, uh, but um, I have a spreadsheet here that I want to share with you. And, but it is not letting me go there. Okay, let's see something. with me here. Um, so this is this sheet. And this one, oh, here, let me try and uh, maximize that. That's not doing that. All right. So here is the what you need to fill out for the water assessment sheet. And um, you have to put in what type of soil you have, really just the texture, what crop, you have to enter this information and um, there's a place here in the instructions where you can, it gives you the website for how you get this baseline township range, but it's not working. But then they also have it in the application and that one works for me. So um, basically uh, you got to go to that website and then you got to drill down a little deeper and then there's these maps and they show this township and range. And I think everyone here is going to be this, um, this baseline, there's three of them in the state, but you should be in Mount Diablo. So, uh, but these other things, you'll need to get what your township and range is, put that in there. And uh, to figure this out, there's also a website they list there, and you can look that up and figure out what type of soil it is. If you have an issue with that, you can contact me, I can help you with that. And then, um, so you'll hear, see here, there's a before and, um, Pardon me. Um, there's a before and after. The after is going to have some of the same information here, unless you're switching crops, which seems unlikely. But here you see, here's the water management. And that's basically, there's three things. As I noticed, flow meter, uh, there is a, there's a, it could be an ET station, there could be like soil probes or other types of, of, of monitoring equipment. So each one of those is a level. So you put what you're doing there. So like, you'll see if we, you know, see, oh, Okay, you'll see the number went down. When I increased it by one level, it's not the same. It, uh, that's interesting, it changed a little bit. Okay, so anyway, and then you need to say the practice as you go down here, there's drip ir irrigation. So that's what you wanna choose. And then it gives you a water savings estimate. And uh, you need to enter the, this number into the application and you'll need to attach this. I will say, unfortunately, if you look at this, um, and I do this, oh, you have to put the acres, um, you know, the amount it's estimating for use for grapes does not match what people do here because 30.6 inches is two and a half feet. So unfortunately, they're using like numbers from the valley uh, and there's no way around this. And CDFA has been made aware that uh, not all these numbers are accurate, but unfortunately, this is what you have to do. And even if the numbers aren't accurate, that's this has to be submitted. But like, you know, really people here are more likely to use say six acre inches per acre and a year would be a lot more uh, reasonable number. And some people are using less um, and some are, are more. So, but I, that's just the way this works. 
So back to this. Oops. And slide. So the GHG calculator, it has to be filled out. It's a little more challenging for people. I had a little trouble figuring it out, but I did figure it out and what I was doing wrong. Uh, but this one's really important. And ultimately this, this program got started, motivated more by reducing GHGs than anything. And it was funded by the Air Board. Um, and so you'll want to, uh, this is important. I, I like this though, even if you end up not applying, I found this pretty interesting, uh, the, the information. And uh, so we'll run through this real quick. Well, not too quick, but we'll run through it in a minute here. Doing too good. Um, but like I say, you have to, um, you have to provide with this the pump efficiency test that you've done since 2019, and you would need to get one if you haven't done one, uh, and you need to provide those records. So back to here, here's the GHG calculator. Um, I have filled this one out as well too. So you'll see there's a tab. Each tab is for a pump, and uh, you can do up to five pumps on one tab and it will put it here in the summary. It will summarize that. So I put in information for two. I can't imagine people are necessarily on this call are applying for more than five pumps, but should you be doing that, then you need to do more than one sheet and attach both. And there's places where you can summarize the collective uh, values on the application. But a um, couple things here, yeah. So, you, well, one, the README tab is helpful. You want to fill this out because then you end up putting in your acreage, and you put in you put in the total funds requested, and then that populates numbers in the summary. So then, you know, when you're actually filling this out, so you put your ranch name. I I never did more than that. Um, so here, you put in the units. I got stuck here because I was putting in like gallons or kwh when i put that that did not work so put in what type of fuel you're using and you'll see there's a drop down menu here with these options and once you populate it with what you're using then when you just put the number here on that and for of units for that type and don't include uh the these units here and it will know what to do from there but if you include the units you'll have trouble so you'll need to look at your uh the nameplate on your uh, motor that you're using, and uh, that that everyone has one. It might be a little dirty. Don't do it while it's operating and hot. Uh, but then you need to put that there, pre-project. And when you do the pump test, um, or if you're if you're upgrading it, your pump, you you probably get this information. Uh, in terms of uh, pumping efficiency and whatnot here, or if there's a change in horsepower, you'll get that and you need to populate that. Um, you know, here you have overall pumping efficiency and, and note, in a, it, it's, it's, that's what it is. It's not motor efficiency. And I'll, I'll show you a report in a minute. They'll list both, but you want overall pumping efficiency. And uh, I've never seen anything over 90. You know, it's not really possible it'd be more like that. I've seen upgrades estimated you know, going from 40 to 60 or 40 to 80 or 60 to 80. So post and pre, pre and post, you got to put those there. Um, this one's optional, but I think everything else in red really needs to be entered. And all these things come off of your report that you'll get, uh, but they don't always get listed this way. Um, let me be a little more specific. The pumping death probably will be listed in feet and you put that, what that is, pre and post. Discharge pressure is generally in PSI, but if you go to pressure conversion here, you can see I, I, I had a pump report where it said 53 is a discharge and you just enter that number and it just gives you this number in feet pressure, which is then what I entered here. And then you'll see there's a little note here, friction losses, 10 feet, for a well pump, five feet for a booster pump. So unless you have more specific information provided somewhere, that's what I'd use. And then there's a drop down here. Are you adding a VFD pump? Yes or no, what type? Already have one, fill that out. You'd put the number from your the tool we just looked at with water savings, whatever it might be, you add that. And then um, you fill out these last few things. So, um, this would be uh, if kilowatt for the system, if you're doing um, solar, and that's not how many kilowatt hours, that's just the kilowatt capacity of the system. 
And then the new fuel type here, it's got a drop down menu with options. And same with here, this has a number of options for what your conversion is. So you'd wanna scroll through that, see what it is. These gray boxes automatically populate. So I did that for one, I did it for pump two. And then you'll see um, over here, it provides some information uh, about what year you entered. Um, but then it sums it up all here. And this is sort of the critical information that they wanna know. And that then you need to enter some of this information into your application. And this is what, even if you don't apply, I find this pretty, pretty interesting. It's put in metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is how it's kind of done in the uh, carbon accounting world is metric tons, which is like also sometimes represented as tons spelled T-O-N-N-E-S. Um, but be, be aware there are different types. There's US tons, there's metric tons. Uh, they want metric tons and carbon dioxide, dioxide equivalent. So that is that. Um, and um, hopefully it will go smooth for you when you do that, should you be applying. So here's an example of a, of a uh, mock report. And you can see here where it has the, uh, okay, sorry, my cursor has disappeared on me. But here you can see it, it has the overall pumping efficiency at the top that's circled. And on number three, it says motor efficiency. That's not what you want. Um, there's the pumping level, item number seven, discharge pressure, uh, other things that you might be interested in. So, Let's see. So um, here is a local uh, pump tester. I, I contacted her. I didn't hear back from her. I assume they're still at it. They're in Sebastopol. They're based out of there, but they travel all over the county and far out of the county. Uh, when I asked in 2019, their basic test was like 300 a pump. It could go up to 500, depending on what you were asking for. Um, I assume it costs more now, just given the nature of most things costing more, but that gives you an idea. It was 300 two years ago. And uh, if, if they can't do it, there are other people, but they are close and they're a certified tester. Here's one they actually did for someone at a ranch I've worked with uh, in the county. And so you can see their, their number item number one, they're saying that they can retro fit this pump and get from 41, they could get from 41 to 60 if they did that. And, uh, and then there's a lot of other interesting information I actually think is on here um, that's worth reading if you do a pump test. I mean, I think it's a good idea to do a pump test regardless of whether you're applying to sweep or not because as pumps get older, they do lose a lot of efficiency and they can have a lot of issues and problems and that's uh, inefficient. It's pumping GHGs in the atmosphere and it's costing you money uh, that you don't need to spend. So uh, with that, um, I am once again struggling to get my, this to move. There we go, there's another part of that report. Um, so then here's the review and evaluation process. Um, as I mentioned, it goes through administrative review. That's just sort of making sure you checked all your boxes, put out the information they want to see in there. They will disqualify it if you, they don't, if you don't have it, but they do give you a chance to resubmit it uh, again. Technical review is where the scientists really look at what you're saying, your project will do, and uh, whether there are water and GHG savings. And then um, that goes into this point system they use where merit and feasibility, you get 12. If there's you know, decent estimated water, estimated water savings, GHG savings, both get 12. Um, budget, uh, if that's accurate, looks good, you get eight. Uh, additional considerations and not, not awarded in previous rounds, you can get up to six. Now keep in mind, I believe if you were not awarded in previous rounds, but you applied, you get three points automatically for applying again. And um, 
to talk about a little bit about this, yeah, they look at your cost share, see how that looks. Um, in that resources that we looked at on their webpage, there's some trainings available. And if you say you're gonna be doing trainings or have done trainings, or you're gonna do them in the next year, you can get a point for that. If you are in a critically overdrafted groundwater basin, you can get a point. We don't have, we have three identified groundwater basins of concern uh, in Sonoma, Santa Rosa Plain and Petaluma in our county, but none of them are considered critical. So there's no point to get there. But if on the same parcel you're applying for a project for and you have integrated new practices like reduced tillage, uh, composting, cover cropping and, and, and things like that, you can get a point for those practices. So how to apply. Um, you need to go through this application. It's, it's kind of long, but I, I think they've improved it quite a bit from when I looked at it in previous rounds. And so I will just talk you through a little bit of this. Here I'm connecting, I, I'm connecting it. So you remember on, on the website, you go to the apply here, which is right in the middle. You, you kind of can't miss it. Um, it's gonna little, look a little different for, for you because I've already registered, so I could get in and look at it. And um, so here we go. So it gives you the ant, some interesting stuff. Like it gives you, well, one, it, it repeats a lot of the things that I've mentioned. Here's the request for applications, that 42 page document uh, that has all the nuts and bolts, the frequently asked questions. And uh, let's see, when you get on it, it'll give you a chance to apply. I've already applied, so um, it's, I can't demonstrate that at the moment. Um, Oh, so, huh. oh, interesting. This is, I know it's too. <laughs> this is uh, from my number from two years ago. So I'm going to do this a different way. And I'm going to go into the website. And, uh, and I'm going to, so what I said before, here's where you go. Apply here. It will take you to this page. And this is nice. It gives you a chance to look at an old application if you've done one which could save you a lot of time. Uh, and then it will give you a chance. I already have a number, so it's here. Otherwise down here, it'll give you a chance to like apply for a number and you click on that. Very simple, it takes a second. I'm gonna click on my number here uh, cause then we can get into the application and look at that a little bit. All right, 1054, All right, we're gonna get to questions very soon here. Uh, but then it kind of gives you lots of directions. Like I say, it's an improvement. Really important, there's a filing naming convention that you really have to use and follow that. And in the application, it'll show you all that. Um, also very important is you have to submit your application. And a nice thing they do is you can work on your application for a half an hour, 10 minutes, two hours, and then you can save it as a draft. And then you have to mark it as complete and then you have to submit it. So you have to go through all the steps. If you just fill it out, they'll never, and, and never submit it, they'll never see it. If you mark it as complete, they don't necessarily see it. You gotta do the whole thing. So if you've already done it and you'll see, there's a green submit button. Um, in my case, I've already done this. So I'm gonna open up what I've done. And then you can see there's all kinds of information. Uh, I'll try not to get you dizzy here, um, but this is nuts and bolts of your, or, you know, your, your, your business and the land and who to contact, so very straightforward. Uh, are you part of a disadvantaged community, uh, et cetera? Um, have you been previously funded? Um, here's the location information. So you just gotta dig that up. Then it gets into, yeah, current system, what are you doing? Uh, pretty simple, you might need to look up a little bit of stuff, do a little research to find that out. And then you talk about the project you're proposing here. Um, and then it talks about, yeah, are you using soil probes or not? You know, are you changing from furrow to drip? Those kind of things, fuel conversions. And so it's all pretty straightforward um, and you just gotta take the time to answer it. Um, here you describe it, but then here's where the uploads start. So, you know, you have the design that we looked at earlier and you describe it here, but then, uh, and answer this question, but then you'd hit the select file and it'll load here. And when you save it, it should be there. But notice, here's the naming convention. You don't use the quotes, obviously, or this number. You put in your number where it says one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
dash sweep design and make sure to name it that way or you could get disqualified if you well one they might not know how to find even know what it belongs to uh depending on how i don't know their process but uh, otherwise they might disqualify you if you don't do it that way and cdfa probably is going to be somewhat rigorous on that um more questions to answer here's the same thing you know water calculations so you've determined these some of these numbers already and then you also have to attach the file you know those are excel files that i showed you and you'll need to save those on your computer and then attach them uh here um ghg calculations same thing as before they ask questions that and you'll need to have already done it to answer some of them. Then you select these files. Uh, it is important to notice they want 12 months of your energy bills, uh, most recent ones that apply. You need to scan it into one document. They do not want 12 documents. They want one PDF with all of them. Um, so same thing with pump tests. Put your pump test here. Oh, here's where you load the calculator. And here's some chance for additional considerations do you do any of these things um, and then if you have any additional attachments that pertain uh, quotes other things that's where you put it here and um, then they have want some things did you get any technical assistance um, would you want to showcase your project and then here's where I said you save the draft if you're coming back later if you're all done everything's loaded you would mark complete and then it's going to give you an option to submit. So I'm just going to hit save draft, not that we did anything. And that is that. So let's see. Um, that's interesting. So lastly, my last slide. Um, if you get selected, um, they'll alert you and then you will be in touch with them. They'll get in touch with you and they will be providing certain or asking for certain information. You will develop a contract. Um, they might do a site visit and then they'll make a little plan. They're gonna to wanna to monitor it for two or three years, I believe. And once again, they'll wanna check in with you or they'll be asking for information uh, or they might wanna come out and do a site visit. So with that, we have made it to the end. Thank you for bearing with me while I talked for almost an hour. And I would like to open it up to any questions people might have. There was a question in the chat for the budget worksheet. Um, and I don't know if it's best to go look at the budget worksheet, but um, it was a question about the installation fee and how to enter that if maybe you yeah. have a flat rate, but um, what it's asking for versus what you can put in there. Um, so do you want to uh, try to make a reasonable hourly rate or just do a flat rate? Well, I what I <clears throat> I would just call your pump company. I mean, I assume that you're already in doing if you already have an ag operation, you probably have someone you've contacted about your pump. If not, um, there's there's a few that do quite a bit of ag work um, and you could contact me and I could give you some folks to call. Um, and you could find out what their their rate is. I mean, I'm I'm imagining like this 120 rate is probably. Uh, I I just made stuff up, but um, it could be that or more. I do not know exactly. So I would say you'd want to contact a vendor and put that rate in because uh, if you use the NRCS rates, it'll probably be quite low. So I would put in one rate, and the hours. But uh, I believe I don't think this auto automatically multiplies it in the subtotal. You need to put what the total would be, and then. Uh, and that would be under labor. Whereas if you go above, you put the actual cost of that pump. And then, uh, and then, so then it'll tell you here what your labor cost is for that and other labor items. So if that doesn't make sense, please uh, maybe you, you know, if folks want to ask a question themselves, um, you could hit, I believe you have the, uh, that button that says ask question and sh or Shannon will call on you, or you can even raise your hand if Shannon's able to see you. I can't see you. Actually. I can see if folks like want to raise hands or even there aren't that many people, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question.
All right, Shannon, you there? Yep, I'm here. All right, any, any thoughts, questions? Right ideas? Because <laughs> if we don't have any, we can leave it there. And I'm gonna assume that's it. Feel free to contact me if you have questions or if you um, decide to start working on this and uh, don't remember something. Uh, we are here to help. Like I said, we can't write the application for yourself or do it all for you, but we can help you along the way. And there are other technical assistance providers that can help you with that. Um, um, Keith, we did have a question. Okay, great. How, how much or does the size of the project matter for applying to SWEET? Um, you know, that's a great question. And in the past, it has. Um, they seem to you know, be funding things that are more like $50,000 and higher. Uh, although I have seen stuff down in the 10, 20,000 uh, range. So, um, you know, as long as it has both greenhouse gases and, and, and reductions and water, it, sh it should um, be eligible. But like, if it's just a few thousand dollars, I, I don't know that they would fund that. And the problem is they have that table I showed you where it showed, um, it, it showed like how many points you get for each thing. And what I'm unclear on is like, if they give 12 points for water savings, I don't know if they give more points because it's more water savings or if they just give more points because you did a good job filling it out. I'm assuming you do, there's probably a combination of both. And so the more you can show you're saving, the more eligible it is. But I do not have a hard answer for you. Like, like they don't say like, don't bother if it's you know under a certain amount. I would also look at the past solicitations and sort of see what the low end of what you're seeing out there is. And that might be, uh, although that was two years ago, that might give you some clues. Um, question again, a good question. Will they cover software development for automating sensors? So if you wanna automate your sensor, will they cover the costs of software development for that? Um, well, I don't know about software development, but if you wanted to integrate uh, telemetry into your system, uh, you know, like something where it communicates between the probes and your, your smartphone or your computer, um, they will pay for that. But uh, I don't see them paying for something where you're kind of creating your own software. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, well, will new solar installation um, contribute towards or count towards greenhouse gas reduction? So if you were um, you're adding a solar installation and offsetting greenhouse gas. Yes, it should. In the, in the GHG calculator, there's a, the, one of the tabs ask, um, you know, will you, you know, are you, or it asks if if you're doing a solar installation, it asks for the kilowatt rating of it, and you if you put that in there, that should impact your your uh, GHG reductions and thus thus the impact of your project. Let's see um, here. Let me just go to that screen. Um, so here we see. Uh, oh yeah, here it is. Um, renewable energy capacity (KW). So say you put in, let's see what it does. If you put in here that you're putting in a 50 kilowatt system. Uh, well, wait, before we do that, let's see. The summary says uh, 66.2. So if we um, put in a 50 kilowatt system and include that, um, it went up considerably. So yes, that's how you do it. Good question. Any more like that or any other questions? Well, great. I want to thank everyone for participating. And uh, 
it's been a pleasure to present this information to you. If you have questions, uh, please be in touch. And if you're moving ahead with the application, I'd be curious to know, uh, and maybe we can help you or help uh, introduce you to technical assistance provider that might be able to provide you additional support and help in the process. Uh, I do invite you to really take a look at their website, the CDFA sweep website, and particularly that RGA, the, the uh, request for grant applications and the question and answers. There's just a, a lot of information there. It, it, this is an interesting grant. Uh, it, it has a lot of positive impacts, but it is also a little more complicated than uh, other grants I've seen for producers. And um, it's gonna take some time to do it and take time to do it right and do it well. And I encourage you to look at that more. And, and like I say, use this as a building block. Even if you don't apply this round, I would say start planning for the next one. Uh, I, I was on a call a few years ago with, with Sweep at CDFA, and they have definitely mentioned interest in moving more into this area. They, you know, we don't really have the projects that have the bang for the buck, like in the Central Valley, uh, just those huge holdings and the furrow and flood irrigation. But at the same time, uh, they want to they want to be responsive out here, and I, I think they have more money and the programs be around longer. So I think there will be opportunities, and I'm hopeful that in this round uh, we'll see more Sonoma S Sonoma projects listed. And uh, I will leave it there and say thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, for being. Oh. Do we have a call? One question. Yeah, we have a great question. Do you mind? Uh, if you are a vineyard management company, would you only be able to submit an app for one of the vineyards that you manage? Or could you do it for more than one vineyard if you manage multiple vineyards? Um, you would have to do a separate application for each um, for each vineyard. My understanding is that, you you know, say you're a vineyard managed company and you had three different places that wanted to apply. They can all apply. You'd have to think a little bit how you, uh, you know, about how you, um, present that in there because you're not, it really you could do all the application but I think ultimately it would need to be like the uh, either the person leasing the land or the, the the landowner might need to be the applicant but you could apply for multiple different places as long as they have a unique APN but you um, you would need to do one application per property you couldn't uh, apply for 10 properties um, under one application, unless it was one thing that benefited, uh, you know, a project that applied to all those, you know, one project that sort of stretched out and covered those multiple properties. But I, I doubt that's going to come up too often. But good question. Yeah, one other thing too is you can submit questions to CDFA. They have a place on that website where they take batches of questions, like you can submit up to a certain date, and then they take like a week or two, I think two weeks, they respond to all those questions. Um, so that's one, you know, if questions come up, that's something. And uh, you can always ask me, I, I can always, I can always inquire a little further, but I may or may not know the answer. So with that, going once, going twice. Um, I will call it and thank you very much everyone for uh, taking the time to participate today.